All right, when, um, when this decides to start. Membrane transport. A major function of membranes is to regulate the flow of substances in and out. Um, remember, our membrane can be called a semi-permeable membrane. It's permeable to some things. What do we say um, that made it special, that made the membrane special that almost nothing could get straight through? What, what about it? It had two parts to it. It had a hydrophobic part, so that was the tails of our phospholipid, and then the hydrophilic ends. So what do we know that's both hydrophobic and hydrophilic to get past those two things? So that's, that's really what's special about our membranes. So um, small molecules, though, can get through. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, those can get through. So we call a mem our, our cell membranes semi-permeable barriers. So what we have um, are, are channels or proteins that help things get through the membranes. And there's different ways that we can get um, from one side of the membrane to another. If we're going down the concentration, concentration gradient, that means we're going from high concentration to low concentration, going down the hill, then that is passive transport. You don't need energy to go downhill. If you're going from low concentration to high concentration, pushing it uphill, then that's active transport. You need to expend energy. So let's go through each. Passive transport can be either uh, what we call simple diffusion, simple osmosis, or facilitated diffusion. So simple diffusion will be small uncharged molecules that can go directly through. So water, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, they can go straight through. That, so that's simple diffusion. It will go straight through. Facilitated diffusion means that there has to be a pore or channel, something where things can pass. It's still going to go from high concentration to low concentration. So in this case, passive transport, which simple and facilitated are, will go from the side one to side two. high concentration to low concentration. It can either be simple or facilitated. Simple, again, it goes straight through, and there, there are only small uncharged molecules that can do that, or facilitated, where we have some sort of channel that they can go through. So we said before, those carrier proteins, they're gonna go all the way through the membrane. So we call them inside out proteins because on the outside, it has to be able to be um, next to, with, attracting to the hydrophobic um, inside of our membrane. And then what we're going to do is let the charged things go through the, the middle. And so that middle of the protein will be um, charged. So remember when we were learning about the structure of proteins, I said, okay, the, the structure of proteins, that they're going to fold so that the hydrophobic um, amino acids are on the inside and the hydrophilic ones are on the outside. And that the main driving force of folding a protein was putting those hydrophobic amino acids on the inside. This is not the case with our, our uh, carrier proteins. They're going to fold so that the hydrophobic ones are on the outside because they have to touch, be next to our lipid bilayer. And then they're going to let things go through the middle of them. They're poor, so they're going to let things go through the middle of them, those charged things that wouldn't normally be able to get through that hydrophobic part of our bilayer. So, you know, if I have a uh, question on the, on the final asking, you know, what is the driving force for, for uh, folding protein, you should say hydrophobic interactions, except for carrier proteins. I might have to you know, put a smiley face if you said that. It's the drive, hydrophobic interactions are the driving force for folding proteins. However, in the case of carrier proteins, that's not gonna, this is an exception. So this is uh, glucose permase is an example of uh, facilitated diffusion. What I have here is a picture 
of uh, a red blood cell, an erythrocyte. We just cut it away. And this blue part here um, is the glucose, glucose permease. And you can see it's a cutaway as well. And it's, it's, uh, if we completed it, it would be um, a, a pour. And so we're going to go from a high concentration of um, glucose in the blood to a low glucose concentration in the, uh, inside the cell, um, which is going to be less than 5 millimolar. So you can see um, that it's still uh, passive transport. Or perme glucose permease is still passive transport because we're going from high concentration to low concentration. But glucose can't get through the um, cell membrane. There has to be a special channel for it, and that's the glucose permease. Let's see if this works. I didn't check this one. so slow. Some proteins in a cell's membrane act as channels for specific ions or molecules. These channel proteins don't use energy at all. They simply allow the materials to naturally diffuse from the side with more solutes to the side with less. Whether the direction is out or in depends on where the concentration is higher for each different solute. I know that was a pretty simple concept, but I just feel like watching the picture just really, you know, the video just really sets it home. So again, it, it can be out or in, and I like that point that um, it doesn't have to be going from outside in the blood to inside in the cell. It can, it can go from inside to outside. The, really the important part that this is passive transport, it's going from high concentration to low concentration, and there's two ways to get around it. The other side, um, the other type is uh, active transport, where you're going to use energy from ATP or something like that in order to, um, to get it to go. We're going to watch um, a video on this, but I want to um, go through it quick. So here, inside the cell, you have more potassium than sodium. And outside the cell, you have more sodium than potassium. What we're doing is we are going to take and bring potassium inside the cell and sodium outside. So this is the sodium-potassium ion pump. So if this were uh, passive transport, you would want, you know, the concentration gradient says, oh, the sodium should be going inside and the potassium should be going outside. This is not the case with the, the pump. Here, we're going to have sodium going outside and potassium going inside. So let's look at what happens. What we have in this picture is showing the, um, the, the enzyme that does this, this carrier protein um, in different forms. So here's the first thing, and then what happens, and then what happens, what happens as, as we go forward. So here what we have is um, an acidic side chain. And what we're doing is we're bringing, it's in the confirmation here to start, that it's going to bind the sodium. To bind the sodium, we're going to use the energy from an ATP. We're going to phosphorylate that. When you phosphorylate the, um, this amino acid side chain, what it's going to do is it is going to um, change the conformation. It changes the conformation so that um, 
it's now open to the outside. When that conformation change happens, it releases the sodium out into the, uh, um, outside the cell. When it's in this conformation, it will pick up the potassium from the high, con high concentration. Um, once that uh, area, once the potassium is bound, then the, we uh, take the phosphate off, right? we hydrolyze the, uh, the phosphate. Once that phosphate's hydrolyzed, then the conformation goes back again. So we have this, um, and releases the potassium, we have this idea that by phosphorylating this amino acid side chain, you're changing the um, conformation, the tertiary structure of this carrier protein. So by phosphorylating this amino acid side chain on this carrier protein, you're changing the tertiary conformation. By phosphorylating a side chain on the carrier protein, you're changing its tertiary conformation. And that energy is used to push the sodium to where it's high concentration and the potassium to where it has high concentration. So again, from the, the sodium and the potassium, they're moving. So again, the phosphorylating changes the conformation to push the sodiums out. And by taking the, the phosphate off, by hydrolyzing the phosphate, it's pushing the potassiums in. So phosphorylating pushes uh, sodium out, and hydrolyzing the phosphate pushes potassium in. So you sort of have this, this uh, carrier protein. It can be like this or like this. So inside my arms is where um, sodium isn't very high concentration. So we're going to start out like this, okay? And so inside here, there's low sodium, but having it in this conformation brings the sodium in, phosphorylating it changes it, the conformation. So we're going to then push it out. When I'm out in this, this concentration, the, the potassiums come in and bind. There's a lot of potassiums out there by taking the phosphate out. It pushes it in. So you can think of when it's in this open format uh, conformation, there's lots of sodiums in here, so they're going to go in, right? And then we're going to phosphorylate, and it's going to squish it out. It's almost like the, um, the go-gurt. You ever have a go-gurt? It's like a tube of yogurt. So like you're, you're, when you're trying to get that last bit and you just squeeze it into your mouth, so this is what's in my house. So what we're doing is we're squeezing it out, right? So here it's open, the, the, the sodiums come in, and then we're gonna squeeze it out, right? And then the potassiums come in, and then we're gonna, we're gonna take the phosphate out, and then we're gonna squeeze it in. So you're, you're pushing it in. You're using, and you're using the energy from an ATP. So let's watch our video. A cell may need to have a substance cross the plasma membrane against its concentration gradient. This requires energy and is accomplished by active transport. The sodium-potassium pump is an example of this process. A large protein in the plasma membrane provides the doorway through which sodium and potassium ions can move. ATP is the energy source. Sodium inside the cell binds to the protein. The addition of a phosphate group from ATP changes the shape of the protein and the sodium is expelled. Now potassium binds to the protein. The phosphate is released and as the protein returns to its former shape, potassium is moved into the cell. Sodium can once again bind to the protein and the process repeats as long as there is a supply of ATP. really cool. Isn't that cool how that works? I, I just think that, again, it's not quite as cool as ATP synthase. That's really complex, and that is, that is probably the coolest thing you'll ever see. But this is, this is um, it's getting close to that. So, the way 
uh, cells can take can talk to each other and respond to the uh, environment is through receptors, which are on the outside of the cell. Um, much like an enzyme substrate relationship, um, where the structures um, must be complementary, we see this kind of um, recognition between um, the protein and the substance that it's recognizing. So again, you're going to have to have the correct three-dimensional orientation. We can also um, poison or inhibit our receptor binding. Um, and uh, they found that most of these receptors are, um, are integral proteins, so they, they're tightly bound. So just like we can inhibit enzymes, we can inhibit receptor binding. Um, they're, they're large, probably very hard to study. That, again, probably would have been, if I chose this area of study, I would have picked this because that's just the way I roll. I always pick the hardest thing. That would have been the easiest thing. So um, endocytosis is the process by which um, solutes can enter the cell. Um, shown here is the endocytosis of an LDL um, uh, cholesterol. So uh, we're going to talk about these in a, in a second, but um, remember um, when I talked about these before, you have HDL and LDL. And remember when you're working out and you're gaining muscle, you gain weight, right? But that's what I tell myself. I'm gaining muscle. I'm losing, you know, so muscle weighs more than fat. So if you have HDL compared to LDL, do you have more protein or fat? High density. Think about that. Just remember, Dr. Barron's working out now. She's going to gain weight. So if, <laughs> no, I'm gaining weight because I'm having too much coffee with sugar. No, um, so you're working out, protein weighs more than fat. So HDL has more protein than the fat. LDL has more fat than protein. So these um, lipids, these lipid proteins are a mixture of cholesterol, phospholipids, and proteins. So the difference between LDL and HDL is the combination. What, what, what do you have more of? So in HDL, you have more protein. LDL, you have more fat. They say HDL is the good cholesterol because it's not just cholesterol, but because it will scavenge our, our uh, cholesterol from our, our blood because it doesn't have a lot of it, so it picks it up. LDL has more fat than protein. So, but LDL, you still need it because what it's going to do is it's going to provide cholesterol, which is a very important part of your cell. We need cholesterol, all right? Don't go on a no cholesterol diet because then you're not going to make vitamin D by going out in the sun. You're not going to have it uh, for your, your cell membranes. You need to eat those eggs as I made for my puppy this morning. I make him scrambled eggs in the morning. Anyway, so here, the way we're going to bring this LDL into the cell to provide our cell with cholesterol is through endocytosis. So there's a, a receptor protein that binds our LDL. It comes in here, and once it's bound, it, <laughs> it sucks it in. Isn't that cool? I just think that's so cool. So it sucks it in and makes this little, um, I don't know, what is it called? Pod of cell membrane and LDL. And so through endocytosis, we're bringing it in, and then we provide cholesterol to the cell. Well, if we have a lot of cholesterol already in the cell, we have an oversupply of it, then it's going to inhibit the synthesis of our, our receptor protein. So then we won't have that receptor on the surface for the LDL in our blood in order to bind to our cells. So if you have enough cholesterol already, then the LDLs are going to stay in your bloodstream. And that's what's going to cause atherosclerosis. Oops. So that's what's going to um, cause atherosclerosis. So then you get your heart attack and stroke. 
So the important thing is that you need to have some, but not too much. Don't they say it's more genetics than, than really what you eat? Whether you're going to get a heart attack? Anybody in healthcare? No. Is that, is that what they're saying now? No. Now, in two weeks, maybe something different. We're, you are not super clean milk yesterday. I'm buying whole milk. Oh, or I meant whole milk. Whole milk. I know. It's crazy, like it. not just because of me. You don't like it? I'm like drinking a milkshake. I can never drink that. Oh my God, it's like drinking a milkshake. <laughs> you can drink, still drink skim milk. It's just, they, they say it's not going to buy you anything. So, all right. So, again, here's our, our uh, lipoprotein. It's a mess. Look at it. Inside, you just have clumps of fats, cholesterol, and then it's wrapped in phospholipids so that it's soluble in the aqueous blood. And then you have um, protein. Remember I, I defined an um, apoprotein? An apoprotein is a protein without, without the prosthetic group. So this is, this is an apolipoprotein. So it's a, if you just have those proteins, so those lipoproteins without the phospholipids and the core, then it's just going to be nothing. So, all right. So then we have our HDL and LDL. We already talked about that. We do have um, other ones. Um, very low density lipoproteins in chylomicrons that you might gear. Um, chylomicrons transport our uh, dietary triglycerides um, from intestine to muscle and fat, and um, very low um, density lipoproteins transport lipids to tissues. So um, I guess this is how when you have excess, this is not carbohydrates, I'm sorry, carbohydrates. I must have been drinking wine there. <laughs> so here, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. No. Uh, carbohydrates. Um, it's going to transport lipids to tissues. So here, when you eat a lot of carbohydrates, you're going to make your lipids and get fat from it. So that's unfortunate. Um, when that happens, you can blame your liver for that. This is what happened in the 1980s. And we were all like zero fat for everything. Everything went from like real food that we ate in the 70s to like plastic everything in the 1980s. 1980s were a tough, tough decade. It really was. We had great music. <laughs> great music. Not great fashion. And very high, what is it, high uh, interest rates. It was like... 18% to get a mortgage. It was crazy, crazy to get a mortgage. Not that I was buying a house in middle school, so no. All right, vitamins. You are not going to get them from GNC. You're going to get them from your food. All right, let's all eat. Good. So here, we have lipid-soluble ones. We're going to talk about now because we're talking about lipids. We have our vitamin A. Of course, we all know that it helps your eyes. Um, vitamin D regulates calcium and phosphorus, and there is a whole host of research into vitamin D. Anybody listen to NPR? So if you listen to NPR, like, the guy that runs the local station is, like, crazy about vitamin D. And we are all deficient in it in, um, in our area. Just remember, correlation is not causation. So when you have all these diseases and you also have low vitamin D, it doesn't mean that the diseases are caused by the low vitamin D. So you really have to be very careful about these, um, these studies. You've got to make sure that they found the link between, between the two. But, um, you know, it, it does, of course, regulate calcium and uh, phosphorus metabolism. I remember... Um, being told that in the decade before having kids, you really need to make sure that you have enough vitamin D so that your bones have enough calcium because the baby will ravage you. The baby will be developed just fine, but will leave you in ruins. It will leach the calcium 
from your, your, your bones and from everywhere. Baby will develop fine. It will just leave you a wreck. So just remember that. So if um, you plan to have kids in the future, make sure that you're getting a lot, enough calcium and vitamin D in order to um, uptake that. Um, vitamin E is an antioxidant. We're going to talk about vitamin E later on um, next chapter. Um, and, it, and it is super cool. Um, vitamin K is blood clotting. Um, so let's talk about each of these. Um, vitamin A, beta carotene, um, or we can call it retinol. It's lipid soluble. What color is vitamin A? Orange. What happens if you eat too much beta carotene? You turn orange. Did I tell you that I had a girl living on my floor my freshman year that all she would eat was carrots? And she turned orange. I mean, visibly orange. And we didn't have self-tanner back then. So you didn't think, oh, she went a little crazy with that self-tanner. So no, she turned orange. And that was because vitamin A is lipid soluble, so it ended up in her skin. And she turned orange. What if they have too much vitamin A? If they eat too much carrots. If they eat too much carrots. Oh, so it'll happen, babies. All right. All right, so this is the reaction. We're going to go over it um, in the next slide. Again, this is an example of where I have the words for the reaction in, um, in this slide and then the reaction in the next slide. So when you're looking at this later, Please just kind of look back and forth. So, um, so again, what we're going to do is we're going to oxidize an OH to an aldehyde. And then we're going to put that aldehyde together with the uh, nitrogen from a lysine residue and an opsin protein in your eye. And when you have the aldehyde with the lysine, so you have the vitamin A with the protein, it's called rhodopsin. And then the, the photochemical reaction is taking a cis double bond and making it trans and going back and forth. And so that is, um, we're going to take that retinol portion, that vitamin A portion of the rhodopsin and go back and forth. And that's what the, the nerve impulse will be. Um, if it's all trans, you're not going to bind to uh, the opsin, the protein. You have to be in the um, cis. Uh, form. All right, so let's take a look at it. Now, those of you that have had organic chemistry, what can we say about these double bonds? They are, starts with a C, Con conjugated. conjugated. When, we have, when you have double bonds, every other bond, so double bond, no double bond, double bond, no double bond, double bond, no double bond. Through resonance is actually, there's double bond character throughout this entire structure right here. And um, what that means is that those pi electrons zoom around the entire structure. And when you have structures like that, that means they are easily able to absorb um, visible or UV energy. So it can absorb photons. So that's why um, when you see things that, um, structures that, that are colored, you are likely to see conjugated double bonds because those zooming around electrons will absorb an, um, energy. So here you can see the conjugated double bonds. This is our beta carotene when we're munching on our carrots. And then in your liver, it's going to cleave it. It cleaves right here and it makes an OH here. So this, your liver produces this. So this is retinol, or vitamin A. So you need your liver there to, in order to get vitamin A. So this is retinol. What did I say would happen next? It's going to bind to, rod. it's going to bind to the opsin on the rod. But before it does, we have to make this OH an aldehyde. And so we have a dehydrogenase, right? Remember dehydrogenases do um, a redox reaction. 
So then we're going to oxidize it, the OH, to an aldehyde. It's all trans. Remember, we said that it does not, the trans won't bind to um, our opsin. So we have to um, have an isomerase that makes this one bond here a cis bond. Now that this is a cis bond, it can bind to our opsin. Our opsin is um, a protein on our rod cells. And here is a nitrogen, the nitrogen on that um, lysine residue. And we're going to form a shift base for you organic chemists. I'm not going to ask that. Right. Shift base here um, on, on this. So here we still have that cis. If we do not have enough vitamin A, you can um, go blind. I think I had a neighbor growing up that couldn't see at night. And she had a terrible, terrible diet. So I think in that she did not have enough vitamin A. So. And again, vitamins may accumulate in fat tissue. So the, the isomerization is just to make it from trans retinol, retinol, the aldehyde makes it an all to an al. The retinol, in order, you have to have it in the trans conformation in order to bind to the opsin. So this, at carbon number 11, has to be in a, in a cis in order to bind to the opsin. Then you make the imine when you bind to the, to the opsin. And so this is rhodopsin. And going back from cis to trans, right here, that's your, your nerve impulse. This is where the photochemical reaction is going to happen. Vitamin D comes from cholesterol. So what we have is cholesterol on our skin. And um, what we're going to do is use a, a photochemical reaction from um, the sun to convert um, cholesterol to vitamin D. So here we have our cholesterol. An enzyme is going to do what to it? It is going to do what? What do I see? Oh, we're going to put another double bond here. And then we're going to chop. The UV chops this bond. I'm not going to ask you like the mechanism. I'm just showing you right now. Um, so here, it's chopping this one, and it's opening up. This is vitamin D3. It's vitamin D3 that is our active vitamin D. So if you go to GNC and you want to buy vitamin D, then you should, um, you should instead eat eggs and go in the sun. Anyway, um, make sure it's D3. So then you're going to um, open it up in your liver and oxygen. We're going to make an alcohol here. And what else are we going to do? About it. Put an alcohol here and then put another alcohol over here. And this is the active form that, um, that stimulates the absorption of cal calcium and phosphate in your, in your intestine. So this is really what does it work, does the work. But what we need to make sure is that we have enough vitamin D3 in our, in our diet. So you can either get it from eating an egg and going out in the sun. What has a lot of vitamin D? Is it, is it broccoli? What has a lot of vitamin D? Spinach? Spinach has a lot of vitamin D. I, I fool my kids, and I, I give them salads, and I put like spinach leaves in the salad. And they're like, what kind of lettuce is this? I think just normal lettuce. It's normal. This is what we eat all the time. So. What is it? Seinfeld's wife made a cookbook. Apparently, she stole the recipes from somebody else. That was a big to do. But Seinfeld's wife made a, a thing where you would actually put like spinach in brownies and feed them to your kids and not tell them that there was this stuff in there. I did that once, and my kids were like, what the heck is this? It's disgusting. So that really
really didn't work. Huh? Zucchini in it? In in brownies? Yes. You make zucchini bread? Oh, no. Zucchini really bread's really delicious. Good. I got zucchini brownies. Yeah. Yeah. It's like cocoa powder. It's delicious. Really? I like that. I, I have to do something because the amount of crap that they eat is just unbelievable. And they don't, nobody's fault but mine. All right. Um, so again, vitamin D. What a, a dermatologist told me, because I'm like, okay, if I put like 100 on my skin at all times when I'm out in the sun, how am I going to get my vitamin D? And, and what she said was, you only need like 20 minutes on your arms to, to, uh, to get enough. It's not like you need to like bake out in the sun like I did when I was a teenager, putting baby oil on my skin. I would think that I got enough vitamin D back then to like make it for a lifetime. But um, she said to just 20 minutes on your arms. Always make sure you have it on your face, but then 20 minutes on your arms is good enough. But yeah. Eat your eggs and then go in the sun. And then, if, of course, if you don't have enough vitamin D, you can have um, rickets or bone deformities. All right, vitamin E, also cool. We're going to see the same slide later on in another chapter. Um, but living in an oxygen environment is not cool. It is like, I mean, it's cool because we can get a lot of energy out of it, but it is, oxygen is so reactive that I'm surprised we're alive because um, it can cause so much damage. And what we have are two things that can take care of what we call re reactive oxygen species. We have um, small molecules, which vitamin E is, and um, we have enzyme systems that can help with reactive oxygen species. And I'm going to talk about those later. But vitamin E is a lipid-soluble vitamin that helps with reactive oxygen species. And what happens with reactive oxygen species or leaking electrons from the electron transport chain is what we get what we call free radicals. We all heard free radicals are bad. But um, we'll talk about why. What they do is they break up membranes and cause wrinkles. So a lot of people put vitamin E on their face so that the free radicals don't get to the membranes on their, on their face and cause wrinkles. So this L is lipid. And so what we have um, is this, this oxygen has gotten to this lipid. It's infected. It's, it's really going to cause some bad things. And we're going to see later that it can not, this free radical can not only destroy this lipid that might be in a membrane, but then pass it on to like hundreds of other ones. So we need to like get this bullet out of there. So what they'll do is the free radical will be passed upon, passed to um, alka, alpha tocopherol. Alpha tocopherol. And um, the reason why it goes from the lipid to alpha tocopherol is because this um, free radical is actually stabilized within this um, ring. So it's resonant stabilized. So that's why it's more stable for it to go from, from the lipid to the um, vitamin E. Now, vitamin E is lipid soluble. So um, it, if it stays in there, then it stays in your body, right? It's not going to, you can't pass it out. So what happens is it gets passed out to a water soluble vitamin called, called, ascorbic acid is called vitamin C, vitamin C, very good. So what happens is the, the free radical then gets passed on to vitamin C right here, and then we can pass it out in our urine. So um, very good. Um, and this is where you're going to eat your, boy, um, green leafy vegetables. Other than spinach, what else is a green leafy vegetable? Kale. kale? Ooh. That's not, I don't, I don't like kale. <laughs> Seed oils, I guess they can be found in whole grains. So everything that we're supposed to eat is right here. So then you can get your vitamin E. Um, very cool. And vitamin K is required for blood clotting. Um, where did we see this isoprene unit before? Come 
Where did we see this isoprene unit that was repeated 10 times? Co CoQ10, right? Remember I said don't eat CoQ6? This is CoQ10. The 10 stood for the number of times the isoprene unit was, um, was repeated. So here's that isoprene unit again. So what do we say that the isoprene unit in CoQ10 did for coenzyme Q or ubiquitone? It allowed it to do what? What was its function, CoQ? To go between which, are you guys okay? <laughs> it went within the membrane, right? From um, the, no, no, it went, it went within the membrane, so it all it had to stay hydrophobic. So it went from complex one and two to complex three. So, and carried those hydrides. So because it stayed within there, this isoprene unit made it pretty um, hydrophobic. So you can imagine it doing it again um, here, although it's not going to be as hydrophobic because here it's only five carbons. So here um, is uh, vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. Um, I'm not really sure what the difference is. Um, all right, so how does it work? What is it going to do to cause blood clotting? Um, blood clotting comes when we chelate with calcium. And this chelating with calcium forms the, um, the clot, actually. So here, this is um, in prothrombin. I can't say that. Am I saying that correctly? Um, so here's the glutamic acid residue. It's going to come together with vitamin K and, um, and then chelate with calcium. And this is, um, is going to cause the, the, the clotting. You know, I'm not going to ask you really much about vitamin K other than its job is to cause blood clotting and um, has that isoprene unit, and the job of it is to ke help chelate with calcium. Um, I'm going to briefly go over prostaglandins and leukotrienes, just so you're familiar with them. They're hormone-like molecules that have been involved in many, many different processes, and it's a huge area of research. Um, so prostaglandins, look at all the different things that um, it can be involved in. So where, what is it? It, it's, um, it comes from arachidonic acid, which is 20 carbons. What does this four mean? 20 carbons. What does that four mean? How many double bonds it has, right? So it's 20 carbons long, and it has four uh, places of uh, double bonds, and we, we showed arachidonic acid, um, this fatty acid in a previous slide um, when we were covering fats. So it comes from arachidonic acid, and um, we make that from lineoic acid by adding a three carbon unit. Um, now, so coming from arachidonic acid to make these prostaglandins that control or have a function in all these things can be inhibited by aspirin and also by cortisone. So if you have inflammation and you take cortisone, it's the way it works is by inhibiting the synthesis of prostaglandins. I know that uh, my daughter will take a steroid when her asthma is out of control, right? And that's, that's uh, inflammation there. So they make things? Yeah, prostaglandins, are, it, it's usually like a cascade of events that causes inflammation and it will inhibit it. I don't know exactly where it does the inhibit, inhibition, but it will, um, so you know, like if you have a problem with bleeding, you're not going to take aspirin, right? It, make, it thins your blood. But that, again, you take aspirin if you want thin blood, right? So you're not going to get a blood clot in your, in your heart. So 
Um, so again, you're, you're, uh, it's a, it's a problem. So, so here, this is arachidonic acid, and it can make prostaglandins and leukotrienes. They have double bonds, but they are not conjugated. So just here, um, take a look at this. Oh, in my slide here, I don't even show the early one. So here's our linoic acid, I guess. And then here is our, um, this is our linoic acid on a phospholipid. So this is the linoic acid on a phospholipid. We're going to take that off, hydrolyze this ester to get and make it arachidonic acid, and then we can, um, we can make either our prostaglandins or leukotrienes from that. Leukotrienes are also, as we just showed, come from arachidonic acid. They're found in white blood cells, and they do have conjugated double bonds. And they're involved in our um, asthma attacks, um, allergic reactions. Um, they also are an area of research for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and if you ever hear the word echinozoids, they're uh, 20 carbon prostaglandin leukotrienes that are a huge area of, of research. So um, know that they come from. Um, so I know. I think the drug I took last night, the Singular, is a leukotriene inhibitor. So um, if, you're, if you take Singular for asthma, then, then that's, and that's why, because it's a leukotriene uh, inhibitor, I'm protected against my asthma and my allergies by taking the Singular. So you probably know too much about me at this point, what kind of drugs I take. All right, that's it for this chapter. Let's take a break.